to FWC Online. We are so glad to have you with us today, and we are very much looking forward to exploring God's Word together, and I hope that you are too. We would love to know that you're with us today, so if you do us a favor and let us know down in the comment section how you're doing today, something that went really well this week, or maybe even something you're looking forward to next week. And if today is your very first time with us, we would love to connect with you after today. All you have to do to help us make that happen is text the keyword CONNECT to 816-800-9937. You'll receive a reply message with a link to our digital connection card. Just tap on that link, complete that connection card, and we'll be in touch. And once again, thank you so much for being with us today. We really look forward to getting to know you better. In just a moment, we're going to be worshiping together in song. But before we do that, worship is so much more than just singing. It's a lifestyle, Scripture says, and it includes every area of our lives. Giving and how we use our finances is one of the most significant ways that we worship because our giving reveals where our heart is at and our heart is what God wants more than anything else. So as you consider your gift today, we want to first say thank you so much for your generosity and for being obedient to the Lord in giving your tithes and offerings. As a giver-supported church, we do not take your giving for granted. It is a blessing when we say thank you. For your convenience, you can give online through our website, fwcsmithville.com. You can give through the FWC app by tapping the Give link or even via mail. The simplest way, however, is to simply text the keyword GIVE to 816-800-9937 and you'll receive a reply message with a link to our secure online giving platform. Again, we want you to know your investment in God's kingdom makes a significant difference and we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And now we invite you to join us in a song of worship today. Shit. 
The next small group semester is gearing up to begin the week of January 30th, and that means registration is open for you to go ahead and sign up. That's right. I want my dollar. <laughs> but some of you are on the ball and already taken that step. But for those who have not, let us encourage you to check it out. Sunday mornings are great, and they are important for your walk with the Lord. But Sunday is not enough. You need to be connecting with each other, Christ followers, and small groups is a great way for this to happen. Yeah. Your faith is not a solo journey. So no matter where you are at in your faith connection, the reality is this. Your connection with other believers provides you with strength and gives you the chance to learn and grow in your faith. And with the busy schedule that most of us have on Sundays, the reality is Sundays just cannot provide all the connection that we need. That is part of why being connected in a small group is such an important part of your faith. Our small group lasts 10 weeks or less, are packed with content and connections. So go ahead, check out the story in the app or in the bulletin and see which uh, group is right for you and register today. Yeah, don't wait. Students and parents of students that are in middle school or high school, by now, Friday, January 14th should be on your calendar because that is Epic's Sky Zone lock-in. There's gonna be trampolines, there's gonna be a foam pit, a ninja warrior course, and Pastor Jeremy even told me he's so excited about this, he's gonna attempt a double backflip for those who come. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. No. <laughs> no? Oh, except that last part are true. Hard to believe that someone like this couldn't do a backflip. <laughs> but the cost is only $30. It covers all your expenses, uh, your entry, your food also. Put it on the counter. Come talk to me afterwards to register. Now, I don't know if you're aware, and probably not, but back in November, Horizon Elementary School here in Smithville blessed our food pantry with over 6,000 food items that they donated. And this influx of donations is a major boost to our inventory. But there are still a number of items that we are critically short on and you can help us out. So if you tap on the food pantry story in the app or the bulletin, there's a link to the list of items we're in need of. If you could just pick a few of those items next time you go shopping, drop them off in the blue bin in the hallway here at church, and that would be such a huge blessing. Incredible blessing. If you haven't yet taken advantage of your free Right Now Media account through FWC, you're really missing out. 
because this resource is filled with over 20,000 biblically based videos on topics like marriage, parenting, youth, addiction recovery, leadership, don't give you their finances, dollars. and so much more. We use right now media for some of our small group studies, and those have those who have benefited from those groups know the power of these resources. And like we said, it's totally free to you from us, and all you have to do is uh, text the keyword right now to 816-800-9937 and tap the link and you'll receive a reply message there to register. Yep. All the details that you need from Family Worship Center along with some other great resources like our missionary updates, spiritual growth resources, and message notes can all be found in the FWC app. Which you can get by texting a different keyword. Text APP to 816 APP. app. 816-800-9937 and tap the link and the uh, reply message below. Maybe even Pastor will give you that dollar you owe right? Those are the announcements for this week and now let's get back into our new series You Lost Me at Leviticus. <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> Good morning. Welcome back to week number two in our series where we are looking at the book of Leviticus where so many of our hopes and dreams to read through the entire Bible in a year go to die. Uh, we're looking at this book because we need to make some sense of these Old Testament laws because in the Old Testament we start some themes that carry throughout the rest of the Bible and if we don't understand them here then a lot of the rest of Scripture is going to remain unclear to us. And last week, we discussed the issue of pride in our worship of God. Today, we're going to explore some of the hardest words that any of us ever say, I'm sorry. Say it with me, and not through gritted teeth, I'm sorry. Maybe you're sitting near somebody, right, on the couch, you need to say it to in sincerity, right? If you're married, that's guaranteed to be the truth, I'm sorry. Is there anything harder than having to say, I'm sorry, to admit, I did it, I was wrong? It's, it's really hard to do that, and nobody likes to do that. I myself have had many opportunities to do this. I've gotten a lot of practice at saying I'm sorry, but it is still tough. Instead of I'm sorry coming out of our mouths, though, what do we do? We prefer to blame somebody or blame something other than ourselves for the actions and choices we make, right? If you have kids, you know this to be true, right? As kids, will not admit fault. Instead, it's always somebody else's fault. The book of Leviticus brings us face to face with our sin and the guilt that we have for it. All over this book, you'll find it telling you that if you do this, it's a sin. If you do that, it's a sin. We don't like that. Like, we're fine with hearing about his sin or her sin, but we don't want anybody telling us about our own sin. That, that, I'm out. I'm not interested in that. But the Bible doesn't just talk to us about how God forgives our sin and makes us right in his sight. It does talk about that, but that's only a part of it. The other part is that God wants you not to hide from your wrongdoing, always blaming somebody else. God is calling us to admit when we have done wrong. God wants us to fess up and own it when we've sinned. In Leviticus chapter 5 is where we're going to start at today. In verse number 3, it says, Or suppose you unknowingly touch something that makes a person unclean. When you realize what you have done, you must admit your guilt. Or suppose you make a foolish vow of any kind, whether its purpose is for good or bad. When you realize its foolishness, you must admit admit your guilt, right? Verse 5, when you become aware of your guilt in any of these ways, you must confess your sin. Notice some key words there. Unknowingly. 
meaning you didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. It was totally inadvertent, but it was still wrong. I'm sorry. When you realize, which means there's a moment you'll understand, ah, what I did was wrong. You're still guilty even if you don't know you're wrong, but you're doubly so when you become aware of it. I'm sorry. Admit, admit your guilt or confess your sin means don't blame, don't obfuscate, don't ignore it. Own your error. I'm sorry. Admit it. Confess it. But we live in a world where no one wants to take responsibility for themselves. We want to blame others. We want to look for anyone or anything besides us as the reason that we did whatever it is that we did. And you can always find a reason to blame someone else. I was dropped as a baby. That's why, right? It's my mom's fault. I wasn't planned, just like 98% of the population. But people use that as, this, as some sort of a reason to live with rejection and lash out at the world and underperform, right? Or what about this one? I was provoked, right? I was provoked. That's why I did it. So if something I do bothers you now, that means you're excused from choosing to assault me? Come on. We have become the greatest victim generations that have ever walked the planet. And because of that victim mentality, we've lost our resilience to face challenges. We've lost our ability to face difficult situations. Leadership is waning in every arena of society, and we're allowing ourselves to be dictated to by life. That's not the way God planned for you to live. God doesn't want your life to be dictated to you by circumstances or pressure or provocation or things that others have done to you. Not, not your past, not even the unique ch challenges that you face in life. God wants you to take responsibility for you. And the way that God has ordained for you and for me to be the responsible parties for our life is through these hard words. I'm sorry. Say it with me. Say it like you mean it. I want to hear you through the screen. I'm sorry. There's a comedian out there by the name of Michael Jr. who tells a story about his son where uh, he got up in the morning and he had peed the bed. And when his dad asked him, hey, son, what happened? His son denied it completely. Wasn't me, dad. I don't, I don't know. Well, then who was it, son? I don't know, dad, but it wasn't me. But you're the only one who sleeps in your bed. I know. Weird, right? Maybe it was a burglar. So Michael Jr. said he's imagining what the police report would look like. Yeah, officer. I mean, the burglar just walked right past my laptop right past my flat screen TV, and he went into my son's room and he peed in his bed. He also peed on a set of Spider-Man pajamas behind the refrigerator too. So like, I mean, you should check that out. <laughs> the problem with not accepting responsibility is the impact that it has on us. See, the Bible says that we have to admit our guilt, and when we admit our guilt, we're actually confessing sin. But hear me, if we never admit our guilt, then how can we ever be forgiven of sin? The reason that God calls us to confession is not because He has some negative plan for your life or because God wants to ruin your buzz. It's because God wants to empower your future and lift you up from being this weak, impotent victim of circumstances and folly and irrational emotions, and He wants to make you strong. He wants to make you confident and responsible for your life and able to respond in power to move forward when, not if, you've made a mistake. So when you screw up, don't sweep it under the rug. Don't, don't blame somebody else for your choice. Own it. I'm sorry. Not my bad, right? That's the distant cousin to apology, right? It doesn't actually land in you. My bad, Whoop, right by. Like, yeah, man, I, I didn't set the parking brake. My truck rolled down the hill, crashed into an orphanage, you know, killed everybody there. My bad, my bad. No. God wants you to admit when you've done wrong. Admit you did wrong when you've done wrong. But there's a difference between I'm sorry and I'm a worm. I'm a complete failure in life. I mean, it's all I'm ever going to be. I'm a total loser. God isn't telling you to beat yourself up when you do wrong. But he also is not wanting you to avoid the problem either. When you do wrong, put yourself at the center of your actions and own it. I'm sorry. So if you're late, don't blame it on traffic. When you allotted eight minutes to get somewhere that is 15 minutes away on a good day, you're late. Why? Because you planned poorly. I'm 
Sorry, if you didn't get that project done at work, don't blame it on your busy schedule. You didn't utilize your time in the right way in order to get it done. I'm sorry. Hear this. If you want to change your life, then own your mistakes. But if you want to stay exactly the same, then keep blaming your mistakes on the prince of the power of the air, or your family background, or the neighborhood you grew up in, or the economy, or whatever. The words, I'm sorry, put you in charge of your own destiny. And when we say I'm sorry, or what I did was wrong, what we're doing is we're owning our actions and we're owning our reactions. We decided then to do what we did, and we're deciding what we're doing right now. But if we blame others, then they get to decide who we will be. Adam may have provoked me. Jeremy may have annoyed me. Satan may have tempted me, but I gave in. I did wrong. And when I do this, I am admitting that I can change my behavior. And I will change my behavior. It's the first step toward a great life. Own it. Just imagine how many marriages would be saved, or at least healthier, if both partners learned to say and mean it when they say, I'm sorry. Imagine how many families would be happier if the parents said, I'm sorry to their kids when they have wronged them, and their kids said, I'm sorry to their parents when they disobeyed. You are not a victim of circumstance. You are not a product of your environment. You are the product of the choices you have made. Now, if a wrong is committed, but the consequence is avoided, it just hangs around us forever. For example, have you ever seen somebody across the store that you don't want to talk to, right? You see them and you're like, oh, I don't want to look at them, don't want to talk to them. Can we say unresolved conflict? We see this in marriages, we see this in churches, we see this in families, we see this on teams. That issue, whatever it is, just hangs in the atmosphere affecting everything it touches. God is calling us to admit our guilt and confess our sin. Don't block it out. Don't excuse it. Even when you didn't mean to do it, own it. Because there is power in your confession that frees you from whatever it is that has happened and it launches you forward into what God has for you. There's only one way for you to be the you that God intends for you to be. And that is this. Stop clinging to the you God doesn't intend for you to be. God has not called you to be a victim, but a victor. When you've done wrong, admit your guilt and get it off you so that you can start being the person God has called you to be. I want to read from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, because it tells us what happens when we do this. It says, If we confess our sins to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice that God isn't just interested in fixing the sin issue itself. He's interested in changing you. If you confess, you are forgiven and you're cleansed. Because up until that point, you're carrying duplicity around with you. Victory and defeat, holy and unholy. But when you confess, God cleanses you from who He does not want you to be. God intends for you to be strong, confident in Him, able to withstand temptation, able to rise above setbacks and not be dictated to by your circumstances, by outside pressure or events that come your way. And the way that we become that person is by starting with, I'm Sorry. Not an equivocation of, it was spur of the moment. Because do you know what the spur of the moment does? The spur of the moment simply reveals what's already in you. That's all it does. See, the spur of the moment causes a courageous man or woman to run into a fire to save somebody else. The spur of the moment causes another man or woman to take two clicks and go too far. It's about what's in us that comes out when we're under pressure. Blaming others will not change your story. We talked about it last week, what pride does to us, right? And we said that pride blinds us, but humility enlightens us. Some people are so locked onto why others are the cause of their problems that they can't see the truth of what's really going on. Let me say it like this. If you keep turning up at the scene of an accident, and you're the one that's always there, hear me, you're the common element. 
Admitting guilt brings you face to face with who you have been. And no, it's not fun, but it's the only way to find true freedom. In Isaiah chapter number 6, verse number 5, we read about a situation where one of God's people finally sees themselves for who they are and recognizes where they're at, and then what happens to it, okay? So Isaiah chapter five, or chapter 6, verse 5, then I said, it's all over. This is Isaiah. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have lived, uh, I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Isaiah recognizes his guilt and confesses it. Then what happens? Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Do you see that? The moment he confesses his guilt, his guilt is dealt with, it's removed from him, and he's cleansed. Meaning it doesn't matter what you've done. There is no sin too big for God to handle. If you feel like you're the only one who is struggling with your specific sin, I want you to understand me and hear me loud and clear. You are not alone. Many individuals before you have fought the exact same battle you are in, and some right now are fighting at the same time you are. You are not alone. But what happens when we refuse to admit that we're struggling, what happens is we get locked into a cycle and we get stuck. And here's how to get out. Admit your sin. And the moment you do, God can step in and begin to fix things. Also understand this, that the closer to God we get, the more aware we're going to become of things in us that need to change. It's like peeling the layers of an onion back to reveal new layers. Now understand, God has already forgiven us of all of our sin, ones we haven't even committed yet, but when He makes us aware of an area or an action in which we're not walking with Him, what do we do? Confess our guilt. I'm sorry. Understand it's not your job to tell others of what you're aware of in their life that needs to be dealt with. Hey, you know what? You've got a real problem with pride or you've got a real problem with this. Man, let me just tell you what. i got the whole list of all the things you need to work with. I've been sitting down with your friends and your family. We've come up with a list of things you need to work on. Nobody likes that person. So don't. That, that's not your job. Okay. But as you seek God, God is going to make you aware of distance between your current state and His holiness. And as He does, what do you do? Wallow in guilt? No. Confess your sin. I'm sorry. The fundamental reality is that you will never change what you do not own. God didn't give His Son so that you would remain in a recurring pattern of sin and failure. We can certainly identify things, contributing factors that may have led you to where you are, but the truth is that in Christ, you are still in charge of your choices. Yes, things like your family background and history, past history of abuse or past experience, even genetic compositions all contribute to your story, but they do not determine the ending. You may have had a damaged past, but in Jesus Christ, you can have a liberated future. You may have had a challenging beginning, but in Christ, you have an awe-inspiring end. And I want us to close today by looking at two kings of Israel. I want to tell you about these two guys, because each one of them is unique in, in the powerful reality about them. Saul and David, both of them sinned. Saul was instructed by God to wait for the prophet Samuel in order to arrive, for him to arrive before making the sacrifices, before a very important battle was to occur. And as Saul waited, days went by. Samuel was a no-show. Saul's army, already outnumbered, but the longer he waited, the more of his men left the army. They deserted. So Saul had enough. And so Saul went ahead and made the sacrifices without Samuel so they could go into battle. And when Samuel arrived, he asked Saul, why have you done this? And here is Saul's reply. But Samuel said, what is this you have done? Saul replied, I saw my men scattering from me and you didn't arrive when you said you would. And the Philistines are at Michmash ready for battle. He blamed his men, he blamed Samuel, he blamed the enemy army, and never once took responsibility. Then we have David, who shirked his role as king, lusted after a woman, raped her, murdered her husband to cover it up, and lied about all of it. And when David was confronted by the prophet Nathan, this is how David responded in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. 
he admitted his guilt. I'm sorry. Saul's sin was minor by comparison to David's. But Saul was stripped of his kingship for his sin, and he lived out the rest of his days in depression and misery. David confessed that he did wrong, and God forgave him. His guilt was atoned for, and David is actually listed as a friend of God. Not that his sin was okay, but to reveal there's power in owning our mistakes. God is not mean, God is not unkind, but God can't help you on what you won't let Him in on. Scripture says that God is faithful, and He is just, and He will forgive your sin and cleanse your life. But you must come to Him and admit, I'm sorry, I've done wrong, and I'm in need of your forgiveness. See, He's already provided for your forgiveness, and He's already provided for your cleansing. And all you have to do is choose to accept what you've done and what He has done. And that's the hardest part for so many of us, to admit, I'm wrong. God, you're right. I need you. To admit what we have done is wrong and is inexcusable. And to come to God and say, Lord, despite what I've done, I believe that what your word has said to me is true, that you provided for my forgiveness and my cleansing, even though I've made some pretty awful mistakes, God. And I'm choosing to trust you in that and ask you to forgive me. And if that's you, if that's where you're at today, I want you to take a step of faith because this is significant. Maybe this is the very first time that you're coming to the Lord and saying, I'm sorry. But understand this, God's love for you is endless. He loves you right where you are at and He is offering the help that you need. All you gotta do is come to Him. And if you would take that step today and give your life to Him, come to Him and ask Him to forgive you, then we wanna know about it. If that's a decision you're making today, we want you to follow the instructions that are on the screen or click the link that's down in the chat section right now and let us know if you're making that decision to come to Jesus and to give your life to Him. And we want to come alongside you. We want to celebrate that. We want to uh, resource you, send you some things that we believe will be a help to you in this journey and come alongside you. The, the information you give us is totally secure and confidential. We're not going to share that with anybody, but, but that is something we want to know about so that we can partner with you in this journey. I want to talk to every single person who is already a follower of Jesus. The reality is this I'm sorry and owning our mistakes has become a lost art or lost value in our world, but also in our churches and in the lives of Christians. When we do wrong, when we disappoint our own standards and the standards of God, don't hide it. Don't ignore it. Come to God. Admit it. Confess your sin. You don't need to, to beat yourself up in penance for your guilt. What do you need to do? Admit your guilt and trust God to forgive and cleanse you because He said He will do it. If you want to rise above those around you, do this. If you want to be a person of strong character, then those words, I'm sorry, will be a part of your vocabulary because you're going to own your guilt when you've done wrong. But if you refuse to own your guilt when you've done wrong, then all you're going to do is you're going to perpetuate this cycle of failure after failure and blaming somebody else and never taking responsibility. And ultimately what's going to happen is you're going to come to the end of your life and you're going to look back and you're going to go, how did I end up where I'm at? And the answer to that question is by not admitting when you've done wrong, by not owning it when you've messed up. I want to close with one illustration that I, in a personal experience I had a couple years back of, I was in a restaurant here in town and um, <laughs> it's weird, it was an odd experience. I, I went to pull my chair out from where it was at and I bumped into a gentleman who was behind me. And I turned to him and I said, oh, sir, I am so sorry. And he turned around at me and he looked at me and he said, don't you ever apologize, it shows weakness. I, I was like, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, wait, I guess I shouldn't say that. <laughs> It really threw me for a loop, and it got me thinking. That is the mentality that so many of us have adopted, that saying, I'm sorry, admits weakness. It doesn't admit weakness. It takes a strong person to admit when they've done wrong. And God wants to work in your life 
in powerful and profound ways. But it starts with you and I admitting our guilt when we've done wrong, coming to Him, confessing it, and trusting Him to forgive and cleanse us. And if that's where you're at today, as we pray, would you confess your guilt to the Lord? Lord, I thank you so much that even when we fail and mess up, that God, you are there and you have already provided for our failures. Lord, how many of our relationships and marriages and, and interactions with other people would be dramatically altered for the better if we could simply learn to accept when we have done wrong, that we would simply admit, I'm sorry, I was wrong, I messed up, instead of blaming it or trying to push it off or it's not that big of a deal. God, if we would come to you and admit our guilt and then come in relationship to other people and admit when we have wronged them, God, there is so much power in that. And that is exactly why the enemy doesn't want any part of us doing this. So God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would open our eyes to those areas in which we are guilty, that we have done something wrong and we need to come to you in repentance. And we may need to go to somebody else in repentance and ask forgiveness and admit we did wrong. And when we're in, a, in the heat of the moment, right? When, when we're in that moment, God, and something comes out that shouldn't come out, may we immediately recognize it and immediately own it. I'm sorry. God, that those words would change our lives if we would say them to you and say them to one another. And God, I thank you that you are faithful and just and will cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we will confess our sin to you, admit our guilt. So God, for those today that are doing that for the very first time, I pray that you would fill them with your joy and your peace as they come to you. And Lord, for those of us who are doing that for the millionth time, God, would you fill us with your joy and your peace and would you help us as we continue to walk closer and closer to you. And as we do that, you reveal things to us that maybe we need to deal with and maybe we're not as close to you as we need to be in this area. It's not lining up with your character. God, even in that, there's no judgment. There is mercy and grace and forgiveness and cleansing in Jesus. And I thank you for it today. Amen. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. I want to encourage you to stick around for the rest of this series. We've got two more powerful weeks left in it. We don't want you to miss any bit of it. So be back with us next week as we continue the series, You Lost Me at Leviticus. Before you go today, let me speak a blessing over you from Numbers chapter 6, where it says, May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, have an incredible week and thank you so, so much for being with us today.